So we just finished talking about probability density functions and cumulative distribution functions. These functions help us describe the distribution of a random variable. Let's now look at the specifics of these functions for the case of Gaussian random variables. So Gaussian random variables are a certain type of random variable that we often encounter in digital communications and in uh, analog communication systems when we do analysis. And we spend our, most of our time talking about these types of random variables and random processes in this class. So let's kind of specialize the, the general talk we just had about PDFs and CDFs for the case when we're dealing with Gaussian random variables. So a Gaussian random variable has a probability density function defined by this equation right here. The probability density function for a random variable x when it's Gaussian is 1 over sigma times square root of 2 pi e to the minus x minus m squared divided by 2 sigma squared. So when we look at this, what we see is that this random variable has two parameters, essentially. It has a parameter m, which we call the mean of the random variable, and it has a parameter sigma, which shows up in two spots down here and up here, and that's what we call the standard deviation of the random variable. Sigma squared is what we call the variance of the random variable. This picture here shows a plot of the probability density function for a zero mean unit variance Gaussian random variable. So by zero mean, we mean specifically that the value m, the mean of the random variable, is equal to zero. And that's why it's centered up here, right at zero. It's centered at zero. And unit variance means that sigma squared is one. So unit means one. So unit variance means sigma squared equals one. So if sigma squared is one, sigma is also one. So standard deviation and variance in this case are actually the same thing. They're both equal to one. And this parameter sigma is what describes how spread out the random variable is. As sigma gets larger and larger, this bell-shaped curve widens and widens here on the x-axis. As m changes, the location of this peak moves around. So for instance, if we had a Gaussian random variable where m was equal to 2, the bell-shaped curve would be right here, centered at 2, and it would have some variance or width set by the sigma parameter. So this is what the probability density function of a zero mean unit variance Gaussian random variable looks like. And just by looking at this function plotted, we know that it's fairly likely that random variables are going to show up here, and less likely that they'll show up out here because the dense probability density is low here and the probability density is high here. Now let's take a look at the CDF for a Gaussian random variable. A Gaussian random variable has a cumulative distribution function defined by this equation. So fx of x is the notation we use in general, but specifically for a Gaussian random variable, it is equal to this equation. And you can see that, like we expected, the CDF is just the integral of the PDF. Here's the PDF, the e to the minus x minus m squared over 2 sigma squared with the 1 over sigma times root 2 pi out front. That function has been integrated from minus infinity to the value x. So the CDF is nothing more than the integral of the PDF, and that's true for any random variable. Specifically for this Gaussian random variable, this is the equation we have because we've plugged in the specific PDF expression into this integral. If you plot the CDF, you get a picture that looks like this here, and you can see what this function looks like. It has the properties that we described before. As x gets very, very large, the CDF approaches 1 asymptotically. As x gets very, very small, the CDF approaches 0 asymptotically. And at any point that we query this function, this function tells us the probability that our random variable is less than or equal to some number. For instance, the CDF evaluated at the point 0 is equal to 0 0.5. So that tells us that this random variable has a probability of being less than or equal to 0 of a half. If the probability of being less than or equal to 0 is a half, then the probability of being greater than or equal to 0 is also a half. The probability that this random variable is less than or equal to 4 is this probability right here. So it's like 0.999. So a very high probability for this random variable that it will be less than or equal to 4. Similarly, the probability that it will be less than or equal to minus 4 is very small. It's over here. So that's a very small number. It's not 0, but it's awfully close to 0. So the probability of this random variable x being less than or equal to 4 is given by this spot on the curve, and it's a small number. So this is the CDF for a zero mean unit variance Gaussian random variable. So just like the previous slide, zero mean means that the parameter m is equal to zero, and unit variance means that sigma squared is equal to one, 
If sigma squared is equal to 1, then sigma is also equal to 1. There's another function that we often use when dealing with Gaussian random variables, and that is the Q function. The Q function is very similar to the CDF. In fact, if you just look at this equation here, this Q function is actually just equal to 1 minus the CDF. So it's the opposite probability. The CDF told us the probability of a random variable being less than or equal to a number. The Q function tells us the probability that a zero mean unit variance Gaussian random variable is greater than or equal to some number. So Q of A is just the probability that the random variable we're dealing with is greater than or equal to A, where the random variable that we're dealing with is a zero mean unit variance Gaussian random variable. So the Q function and the CDF are just complements of each other. So this definition right here of the Q function, you can see what we've done. We've actually plugged in the specific values of sigma equals 1. So the sigma's gone here because there was a sigma, but it's equal to 1. Similarly here, there was a sigma squared here, but when we're restricting ourselves to the univariance case, sigma squared is 1, so it's kind of disappeared. And the same thing with the mean. We used to have the quantity x minus m squared, but when m is 0, that just turns into x squared. So really what we've done is we've taken the CDF expression that we had and done 1 minus it and also plugged in the special case of zero mean in unit variance. So when you're dealing with unit variance, zero mean Gaussian random variables, if you want to know the probability that that random variable is greater than a number, you simply query the Q function to find it out. Or you could query the CDF and then do 1 minus to get the Q function value. In general, this function is also useful for other Gaussian random variables, though. So if you happen to be dealing with a Gaussian random variable that has some other mean and some other sigma, you can still use the Q function to compute these probabilities. So let's say that you're dealing with a Gaussian random variable whose mean is m and whose standard deviation is sigma. If you want to know the probability that your random variable is greater than some number x, well, then you just query the Q function at the value you're looking for, subtract off the mean, and divide by sigma. So for instance, maybe you're dealing with a random variable, Gaussian random variable, whose mean is 4 and whose standard deviation is 2, and you want to know what the probability that that Gaussian random variable has a, it has a probability greater than, say, 7. Well, then you would put a 7 here, and you put a 4 here, and you put a 2 here, and you can compute that probability. If you want to know the probability that the Gaussian random variable you're working with is less than or equal to a number, well, you could just plug directly into the CDF because that's exactly what the CDF tells us, the probability that a Gaussian random variable is less than or equal to some number. Or if you have a Q function available, you can plug it into your Q function like this and then do 1 minus because, again, the Q function and the CDF are just complements of each other. There's another important relationship with the Q function that comes up a lot, and this just has to do with the symmetry of the function. The relationship is that q of x is equal to 1 minus q of minus x. So sometimes this is very useful. And what this lets us do is it lets us have a table of q values for positive values of x. And we can easily compute q functions evaluated at the negative values just by doing this 1 minus operation. There are other functions very closely related to the q function. They're called the error function and the complementary error function. And these are just other functions that people have, you know, developed and stated over the years. Depending on what discipline you're in, whether you're in mathematics or whether you're in engineering or whatnot, you might use the Q function, you might use the complementary error function, you might use the error function. They are all very similar to each other. They basically differ just slightly based on some scale factors. For instance, the complementary error function evaluated at the point x is just our Q function evaluated at the point x times root 2 and then with another 2 thrown out front. Similarly, the Q function is equal to 1 half 1 minus the error function of x over root 2. So these functions are all very similar and uh, depending on what software you're using or what discipline you're in, you might be using the Q function or the complementary error function or the error function. And even with these, you have to be a little careful because sometimes these functions are defined slightly differently in different textbooks. So just make sure you're familiar with what version of the error function, complementary error function, or error function that you're using, and you use the equation you think that you are.